thank you so much for coming out on this night of uh, beer snakes and patron saints. Uh, this is uh, A2 Utah, uh, as uh, many of you are undoubtedly aware. Um, every month we have uh, five companies uh, come and uh, present for uh, five minutes. Uh, to tell us about uh, their company, uh, what they're doing. Uh, and then each of those presentations is followed by a uh, five minute Q&A. Um, so if someone says something that uh, piques your interest or you have a follow-up question for them, uh, please hang on to those uh, for that. Uh, and then uh, in between the sessions, we'll have time for community announcements. Uh, so if you know of uh, job openings that are coming up, um, tech events that are coming up, uh, uh, anything of that nature, please uh, have those ready as well to share with the community. Um, I'm your host, uh, Zach. Uh, uh, I work at a, a company uh, here in Ann Arbor called uh, Olark. Um, yeah, and I think that's all the stuff I have for now. Um, uh, our first uh, presenters uh, are no strangers to the Southeast Michigan uh, startup community. Uh, please uh, welcome uh, Jake and Mike from Rumble. Hi, um, I'm Mike. This is Jake. Um, once again, our company's name is Grubbable. Um, basically, what we are as a company, we partner with restaurants that serve local food ingredients. Um, and we have a membership network that we're creating um, that allows members to dine at those restaurants at a discount. Um, so that's kind of the, the overview. Um, basically, um, as we've been creating the company, we realized that when given the opportunity, a lot of people, um, basically everyone we talk to when they have the choice, they desire to eat at restaurants that are healthier, right? If they have the choice, they want to eat at restaurants that support the local economy. Um, and again, if they have the choice, they want to eat at restaurants that are good for the environment. Um, however, what we found is that as we've been talking to people over and over and over again, people run into basically the same two issues um, that hinder them from eating at those kinds of restaurants. So first thing that prevents people most of the time is discovery. So they don't know exactly which restaurants are using ingredients that are up to those standards. Um, so discovery is the first thing. Second thing that we usually run into is that people, um, at the end of the day, they, they just don't want to pay more for food if they don't understand the quality of the ingredients. And so the price is the second barrier that we often run into. Um, so what we are trying to do is create a holistic network where people see um, which restaurants are being sourced from local farms and so that we can create more of a sustainable system um, in Southeast Michigan. Um, now, when we talk to people in Detroit, we're from Detroit, by the way. Um, when we talk to people in Detroit and we ask them, hey, which restaurants source local ingredients, most people can't name more than five restaurants off the top of their head. Now, in Ann Arbor, I imagine people can probably name a few more, but probably not more than 10, right? Um, but what a lot of people are surprised about is that there are a lot of restaurants that source locally at some level. So they might just get their chicken locally, or they might get their produce locally when in season. Um, and so these are some of the restaurants, these are probably about a fourth of the restaurants in Detroit Metro that source locally. Um, surprisingly enough, there are a lot, over 100. And um, we partner with all these restaurants, we actually partner with probably about 20 or 30 more. Um, and so we're, um, we have everything from fine dining to, to casual dining to food trucks to desserts, smoothie places, all that sort of thing. Um, but, so back to the discovery piece. One, it's one thing to point people towards restaurants that serve local ingredients, um, but there's another issue of having people know what exactly um, is being sourced locally in that restaurant. And so what we developed over, you can't really tell right here, but those circles are what we call the grubbable bad, badges, and those tell customers at a glance what ingredients that restaurant is sourcing locally. So if you're going out for you know, a nice dinner one night with your wife or husband, um, and you want to eat a nice steak, you can choose a restaurant with a, with a local beef badge, knowing that that restaurant sources beef that is um, locally raised within the state of Michigan or 400 miles, um, and is all natural, so it's free of any harmful hormones or antibiotics. Right? Another thing that people can discover is um, the farms and artisans that actually support the restaurant. So you can't really tell, but there's a list of farms that are supporting this restaurant um, and sourcing their ingredients. And so if you click on that, you get to learn about different farms and artisans. You kind of learn about the farm itself, but also its raising practices, its growing practices, and, and so forth. Uh, you can also see what restaurants, um, other restaurants that farm is sourcing. Um, and so really, we have that discovery piece, right? So people, we want to point people towards the right kind of restaurant. The other thing um, with the price, I'm going to jump over to the website really quick. Um, what we're doing to address the price issue is 
we're creating a network, right? So we have a network of partner restaurants who don't pay to be part of our network. And then we have the consumer membership side of things. Now anyone can go on the website and discover all these things about the restaurants, right? They can see, you know, which farms are sourcing them. They can see what ingredients they're sourcing that are local. Um, but when someone becomes a paid member of Grubbable, a couple things happen. So the first thing that happens is that their first month membership fee, which is $4, um, 100% of that gets donated to a nonprofit of their choice in the city. Now we've curated those nonprofits a little bit so they choose from a short list, um, but we're just trying to model like a holistic kind of um, um, community development attitude. The second thing that happens is that they become eligible for any discounts that a restaurant wants to offer. So every restaurant that you saw on that list earlier, and we have over 60 currently, um, has promised to give every Grubbable member who walks through the door at least 10% off every entree. So whenever they eat, anytime there's no blackout dates, um, they get at least 10%. Now these are restaurants that often don't give discounts at all, um, and some of them are, are, are excited to use as a marketing strategy to offer higher and higher rewards to bring in people. Um, so that's kind of the basic gist of our, of our company. So. Cool, thank you. commend you on, on endeavoring on, on a, a, a startup project that is actually s addressing real problems and, and, and having a bigger vision for our sustainable future. So thank you. Yeah, have you ever met the Car Roseanne real time farms? Uh, we haven't. I'm familiar with the website though, it's a crowdsource. Now who do you do? Yeah, now who do you do? Uh, all right, we'll talk afterwards. Okay, cool. Yeah. How do you scale? Yeah. Like, are you out there getting restaurants and customers yourself? Or how do you go from these few restaurants to, you know, across the Midwest? Yeah, so, uh, questions about scale. Um, currently, we have uh, account representative on the ground gathering restaurant <coughs> partnerships. So right now, in the basis, we haven't launched yet, so we have, we have zero members. But we wanted to, as a marketplace business, we first wanted to address the, the, the business side of things. So we talked to the restaurants first, and so those are just mostly um, drop-ins and talking with owners. Um, if you're familiar with the restaurant space, it's very tightly knit and kind of closed off unless you're kind of on the inside of things. So it took a little bit of time, about maybe eight months or so, to get up to 60 restaurant partners who agreed to, to do the discount sort of thing. Um, but in terms of scale, we have our expansion plan kind of set up and ready to um, come to Ar Ann Arbor next, actually. So, yeah. So if I'm a local restaurant that doesn't want to give you, or doesn't want to give a 10% off, you just won't list it? Yeah, currently our business model doesn't, doesn't have room for those restaurants, right? Um, we want to keep it as simple and streamlined as possible. So every restaurant has that's on our network has agreed to give at least 10% off um, for oh, entrees every time. Else? Um, yeah, so they can give drinks or desserts. We have, we have, was that, I'm sorry, no, was do they pay grubbables? Anything else, or is your whole, is your business model purely membership fees? Great question. So our business model, the monetization is twofold. So one is the, the membership fee. On the restaurant side of things, our heart is really to partner genuinely with the restaurant. So we're not trying to take a big, you know, cut that ends up like not sustainable for the restaurant's business model. So we actually have, we take 1% of that entree's list price or any other um, discount that's listed. And so if they are offering a, you know, 30% off dessert special one night and people go in and redeem it for, you know, they get their dessert 30% off, we get 1% of that dessert's list price. So it's, it's a small chunk we want to be sustainable for the restaurant. I think I saw your hand first. Sure. Uh, so you're asking me to care where the food's being made. What are you doing on the farm side? So I saw you had a little history about you know a particular farm, but me as a user, maybe I'd love to go to the farm. Um, is there something that you're doing for that? Great question. So currently, right now, we're just giving free free promotion to the farms. We love what they're doing. If they have programs already, and we're partnering with a bunch of um, purveyors that do sort of, you know, like field trips and things of that nature. And so if they have events, they can post it on their page. But currently, we're not trying to, we're not trying to do everything well, but we're, you know, we want to give them props for what they're doing. Um, but we're focusing more on the restaurant customer interaction currently. Yeah. Can you make reservations through your platform? And have, do you have any integration with OpenTable? 
Um, not yet. We've tried. I think because we haven't launched it. Well, they rejected us for now. But uh, <laughs> we haven't launched yet, so um, you have to apply to be part of to have their sort of system integrated into your site. And prior to that, could you make a reservation through your platform? Um, we haven't developed that yet. Um, we, it's definitely on the on the thoughts. We haven't yeah haven't decided yes or no yet. Do your restaurants um, promote you and what you're doing on their websites? Totally. So we are in conversation of how exactly restaurants will promote us. So a lot of these restaurant owners are excited because they see that kind of the mentality that all ships rise with the tide, right? So as we grow the community, sort of the, the social consciousness of, of consumers and more people are aware of the local food movement and want to want to eat at places that are good for the community, um, the more people that are like that, the more people go to their restaurant. And so a lot of restaurants are excited. We have window stickers, table tents, posters, little business cards promo cards that um, we get, we give the restaurants the choice of choosing a few of those to use. Yeah. On the user side, uh, I gotta tell you, I'm skeptical of people spending $50 a year to be a member and maybe mm -hmm. use it or maybe not. Sure. Uh, if anybody has had experience with restaurant.com and using those coupons, I'll tell you that those are things that you actually pay for and intend to use, but I've actually had a full year go by and not use them at all. Right. So what I'm wondering is, two things, well, what sort of research do you have that tells you that people are going to spend $50 a year for this? And secondly, what's the number of people that you have to make this a go from a profit standpoint? Right. Um, so our research is showing that people who pay to be part of, so restaurant.com, it's like individual coupons, you know, you're trying to, I'll buy a coupon for this restaurant, so I have to make sure when I go there to remember to pull it out of the drawer or whatever. Um, research shows that when people pay to be part of a network, however, they're much more likely to partake in that network. There's that perceived value of, you know, I paid for a Costco membership, I'm not going to go to Myers as often, you know. I paid for Netflix, I'm not going to buy from Amazon Video as often. You know, they might still, you know, uh, partake in a little bit here and there, but in general, when things are hitting the bank statement monthly, um, people want to get their value out of it. Well, those are, those are more general, not niche. This is very niche. I mean, so, and then the second part is how many how many users does it take for you to, be, you know, be profitable? Yeah, so we can we can scale we can expand at five thousand users in Detroit Metro. We're shooting for sixty thousand the first year. We don't think that's out of the out of um, other questions. Thank you. Now is also an excellent time to point out that uh, frequently uh, after the presentations, uh, both the, the presenters uh, and uh, members of the audience sort of stick around. Uh, so if you have uh, more follow-up questions or something like that, uh, please uh, stick around afterwards uh, to be able to ask that to our uh, presenters. Uh, while Ann is getting set up, I'm going to quickly um, shout out to our uh, sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the University of Michigan uh, Law School uh, Entrepreneurship Clinic uh, was instrumental in uh, allowing us to uh, be able to use this space uh, here at the law school with its lovely uh, comfy chairs and powerful projectors. Uh, R2B is our uh, truly amazing uh, video recording uh, service. Um, nearly every HU tech, if not every HU tech, is uh, available online. There's a comment on each uh, meetup page, uh, and that service is provided to us by Roger, uh, representing uh, R2B. Um, and last but not least, um, A2 Geeks uh, is a very unusual uh, meta organization uh, here in Ann Arbor uh, that provides a lot of um, infrastructure support um, to other uh, meetups uh, like ATU Tech, also the Ann Arbor uh, Mini Maker Fair, um, Ignite Ann Arbor uh, Geek Tours, and a host of other events. Um, so if you're interested in this idea of helping community organize uh, in Ann Arbor, um, definitely check it out. Um, man, I never know uh, quite how much uh, introduction to do for our speakers. Um, Ed, 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 you're a serial entrepreneur. You presented a couple times at H and Tech before. Just I would, one second. Oh, okay, just once. I would, I would consider you like a like a, a hustler uh, with all the positive connotations and none of the negative connotations. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Ed. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ed Farrell. Uh, my background is in uh, starting uh, companies that build software products. This is my first startup to build a physical product, and also my first Kickstarter, and my first uh, foray into offshore manufacturing. Uh, before I started the Kickstarter, I read everything online about how to do it, how to grow, uh, uh, and how to market a Kickstarter. 
but uh, what I uh, didn't realize is how difficult it was going to be until after I launched. Um, and what I'm going to do is share kind of a week by week uh, overview of my journey as I search for that scalable business model. Uh, but first, what I want to do is give you a quick overview of the product and the problem we're solving. Everyone uh, who has earbuds is familiar with the problem with earbuds tangling. And since this is AQ New Tech, I've got to talk about technology. The existing competitors kind of rely on. 2,000-year-old uh, technology uh, spool. Um, the problems with the existing products, uh, they're bulky, slow to unwind, and there's something else to carry and easy to lose, whereas our technology is uh, several thousand years more current, rubber band. Um, this is Bud's band. It's a uh, tiny earbud organizer that attaches to your cord and allows you to keep your earbuds tangle free. Uh, two primary advantages, it stays on the cord so you can't lose it, and it has a quick release so you get instant um, access to your earbuds. More advantages you don't care about. Uh, the reason we did a Kickstarter is to answer uh, two things. One, would people buy it? And number two, after they bought it, would they like it? So uh, based on uh, research of competitive Kickstarters, uh, similar to ours, thought uh, we could launch a PR campaign and get some initial traction. And that, that turned out to be a complete failure. <laughs> uh, no traffic. And in the first three days, we only had $806 in, in uh, pledges. But what was interesting is there was a 40% conversion rate. So I kind of scrambled to find paid traffic, found a guy that had a Kickstarter uh, list you could uh, advertise on, and within three days we did 6,000 in pledges. And what was really interesting is 60% of those people converted, which was just encouraging. So we were very encouraged. This was obviously scalable, put in one X, get out uh, 12X. So we thought we'd repeat it, did a 30,000K email list, and we're just waiting for the money to roll in, and we got less than 1x on that. So going into week three, need a bigger list, did 200,000. And out of that, again, less than 1x. Um, so I was kind of learning how to do it at this point and doing cross-promotion and other updates. Uh, we found it to be super effective, get one to three, four grand in pledges just in promoting on another update for another Kickstarter. Um, week four, more updates, and since the first list was proven, we went back to that, did it again, got a 10x return, which uh, we we're getting smarter. Notice it's going up, we're up to 20,000, and with three and a half days, I ran into a guy named Zach. Not this Zach, <laughs> another Zach. He said he was really good at doing Kickstarters, and I allowed him to uh, market it, and he got a small piece of the action for doing that. In three and a half days, he went from 20,000 to 40,000. Uh, in the last 12 hours, when he got things optimized on Facebook, he went uh, from, we had 7,000 video views, and we took that up to, uh, he drove uh, 8,000 more. Those are the <laughs> so it uh, was amazing. We ended up uh, fourth most popular out of uh, 7,000 projects on Kickstarter. And what's interesting, you see that Basics wallet? That was another Zach project. He took just a simple wallet and he had 25 days. Fortunately, I only had three because I don't know um, what would have happened if he had done it for 25 days. Uh, so we ended with about 40,000, 2,000 uh, backers that we had to ship and make it and ran into manufacturing delays, which is something you should expect. This is what the parts look like when they come off the, the tool before they're cleaned up. And we ran into shipping delays with uh, the labor dispute. And even though we were doing air uh, shipment, um, let me just do a quick finish here. 2,000 orders to ship out. Uh, employed my kids, gave them an incentive plan. <laughs> Did a quick uh, survey after, and surprisingly, 95% of 
the people were very satisfied or extremely satisfied. Here are the lessons, obviously, make something people want, um, and then have a proven plan to market to Kickstarter, find a Zach, and the others are kind of bothered, so. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Where did you find that? You know, uh, I wish I could say through hard work and intelligence, but Zach found me and messaged me. And you have to keep in mind, when you do a Kickstarter, you get a bunch of people that come out of the woodwork and say they can help you. Zach messaged me late at night and said, hey, I think I can do 10 grand a day for you. And he mentioned this wallet project, and I was familiar with the guys because I had seen their project in week one, and they, they were struggling like I was, and we shared notes back and forth. I looked over at their project, and they had 100,000, and I messaged them at, you know, 10 at night, is Zach behind this? Mm -hmm. And they said yes, so I said yes to Zach. He took three days of testing. He's really figured out how to do Kickstarters. He's done five million uh, raise of Kickstarters. He just did a project that got 1.3 million for a suitcase. I mean, he's got it optimized. Uh, I don't know exactly how, but uh, he did amazing stuff for us. Yes? Uh, I didn't quite understand what you meant by cross-promote. Are you cross-promoting with other Kickstarter campaigns? We are. Um, yeah. When you do a Kickstarter, you should do weekly updates or more often. And uh, you can put a little pitch email or pitch message at the bottom and those things uh, drive a ton of traffic. And that's why when you launch, you really want to hit your goal in one to two days, get your numbers up, because then you're attracted to other projects that have a lot of backers. Because if you go to a back a project that has, say, 2,000 backers and you have 100, they're not really interested in doing some kind of reciprocal marketing. But once you get those numbers up, um, you can, they will take you seriously. Yeah. So you talked kind of a little bit about your lessons besides spending a Zach. Uh, is there like a buzz band two in the works? And if so, like what kind of things would you change? Like US suppliers or things like that? Uh, there's minor tweaks we can make to how it works. And then there's other chords people have uh, in the survey said that they want. It's things really designed for you know 95% of the earbuds out there, ones with huge plugs it doesn't work well on but we try to design kind of a minimal, unobtrusive design um, for the majority of the earbuds. Yeah. Do we have a time limit for us here? Excuse me? Do we have, do we yes. have a time for? Yeah. I'm a factor. It's kind of small, so I didn't really want to. Yeah. You decided to sell directly to consumers, so it was the, the B2C approach. Why didn't you pick up something like uh, B2B, talking to the big development distribution chain and, and so on and so forth? That's where we're going next. Um, Kickstarter was a way to launch because even though I thought, you know, this was an improvement, um, you don't really know if people are going to like it. And going directly, uh, to retail or to a distributor, they're going to want to know uh, who else has bought it, and you really need a track record to show that, yeah, people have bought it and they, they do like it. So that's why. It's pretty low risk to do a Kickstarter. Yeah, it is. There's a fair amount of effort up front, um, but versus the alternatives, it's way better. Thanks. How, how did you prototype? What was your process for making your and testing your uh, and come up with your idea? Even? I'm used to working with uh, uh, kind of bits, not atoms, so to speak. And uh, so I just bought material, hand prototyped it, and uh, so I got that's silicone. No, <laughs> I bought sheets of silicone. Oh. And the problem is you can't three D print silicone. Mm -hmm. It's a chemical process organization. By the way. So it was really tricky to get it right. And I had the tool made and uh, wanted to have a prototype tool. The guy said, no, we can just do a production tool. We did the production tool. We had to change it. Um, and so I learned a lot there. Yeah. 
and it's a huge tool. It has a lot of cavities. So it's very expensive. Even in China, to change each cavity. Not much, but it's a few beers. There's a question. Right here. Hi. I'm sorry if I missed you, but what was the price point? Uh, the price point on Kickstarter was 10 bucks for two and down to seven something if you bought more. You don't have to divulge, but would you say that's a high margin? Uh, yeah, even at low volumes. <laughs> <laughs> Our business model is buy, set, buy low, sell high, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, man. Yeah. Maybe one more question. So, what was there about the first list that was attractive in its properties that if you could, you would never Kickstarter backers. Oh. And so, you really, you may have people that are interested in this area, but you need the kind of intersection of people interested in this stuff that also will put down money on Kickstarter, right? And this was a list of like the average number of projects each person had backed was like 50. It was crazy. So they just, I mean, I had rates as high as 90% during certain time segments of people that opened when they saw the video and bought it. It was crazy. And there's very few of those out there. It's kind of a specialty niche for how to market. I found out, and that's where getting someone who's done it, um, they know all the tricks. Thank you so much. <laughs>14 people, I think, right now looking for some front-end developers, back-end developers, uh, implementation specialists, project managers. Um, if you like a combination of some of the aspects of a startup company, we're small and you can make a big impact, but some of the benefits of an established company, we've been around five or six years, have some big-name clients looking to grow, um, please check us out. It's geo-nexus.com or come see me after, after we're done. Thanks. Yeah. We'll do one or two more hands for, I think I saw your hand first. I am 
Okay. Also, Scott, uh, I work for a company called Apartment Therapy Media, um, and I am looking for a Rails engineer. So it's, it's a remote gig. Um, our office is based in New York. I'm based here. Uh, our engineering team is all remote. So if you like the flexibility of a remote job of working from home or co-working, um, but you want to work for a cool company with about 30 million monthly visitors, um, slowly growing bootstrapped, um, it's a great team. So uh, come find me. Cool. And then there's Ann way back there. Yeah. For uh, Geo Nexus, are, are those are all positions full time or part time also? Uh, I'm looking primarily full time, but we'd certainly be open to part time situations. So yeah. Thanks. And we're going to advise uh, people on job openings. Uh, you might want to go to the meetup.com page and post a comment on this event with uh, contact information so that people at this event or afterwards can get in contact with you easily. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. I guess uh, without further ado, uh, it goes over to uh, Russell. All right. Uh, first, my name is Russell Schindler. I'm with sampleserve.com. Um, we do environmental sampling and then uh, kind of morphed into a data management and reporting company. Just to give you a little bit of background, what we do is uh, collect environmental data and then present it. Um, spills happen. There's kind of a quick rundown of exactly how it all works. You get a leaky tank or a dispenser or something like that at a gas station. could be an industrial facility. Leaks into the ground. Uh, we go out there and install monitoring wells. This is what a typical monitoring well will look like. Um, and then these wells have to be sampled. A typical site will have uh, at least three wells, and sometimes we've got a site up in Flint that has uh, about 300 wells. These wells are usually sampled multiple times a year, tons of data coming out of those wells, and these projects last uh, anywhere from five to 40 years or more. Um, right now, the typical consulting engineering company writes their notes you know, in a field book just like this one here. Um, they handwrite labels, they handwrite the lab instructions, typically called a chain of custody. And then when all that data gets back from the lab and they take the field data, there's a bunch of iterations back and forth between the AutoCAD guy, the GIS guy, and the project manager, and uh, this all costs a lot of money. So what our software does is it, uh, basically the project manager can input all the details that they want for all the sampling, what they want to sample for, who they want to send the samples to, that kind of thing. And all that information then gets disseminated out in terms of documents and just information. The field tech gets his labels printed, the laboratory knows exactly what they're going to be testing for. Regulatory agency can be notified and informed, sent to them if need be. And uh, then the client gets all the various input graphics that they need in order to look at what's going on at that particular site. It makes the field tech work easier in that it prints all their labels for them, uh, does their chain of custody, the lab instructions, prints out forms that they need to fill out in terms of what data they need to collect. It's got pictures of where they're going to be sampling. Uh, the client, uh, the, the engineering consulting company makes their job easier in that it does all their grass tables, um, uh, the classic table, color codes, whether or not data is above or below criteria. And then uh, it also does maps with the data printed right on the map, um, uh, color coded again uh, above criteria. These maps typically, on the traditional method, uh, take hours and hours to generate. Well, once the data is into our system, we can generate these in various ways in just a matter of seconds. Um, our software also does groundwater contouring. Basically, it just uses the existing data and tells you which way groundwater is flowing. And it'll generate a graphic again in just a matter of seconds. And then it also takes the chemical concentrations and we can develop what are called isochemical contour maps, show you where the hot spots are at. And, uh, um, and again, you just pick and choose what days you want to show that data for. We also can do um, cross-sectional isochemical contours, basically showing you how deep contamination is, um, all kinds of ways to present the data. Um, and what's next is what we want to do is right now is a, a web-based application. We want to develop a mobile app. Um, I have been self-funding this project or this software uh, myself just through revenues that we can generate from sampling it. And now I want to go to a mobile app and uh, the costs of doing this are going to rise exponentially. Um, one of the key components of this mobile app is that you'll be able to enter the field data right from your, your tablet application, generate a QR code, uh, print the QR code on the label. The, as that sample goes to the lab, the, the um, that will be able to just upload that data instead of a handwritten chain of custody, they upload it right off the QR code. Uh, who wants our product? 
consulting engineering companies and anybody who deals with uh, any kind of chemical contamination. Uh, one of the nice things about our product is that it's required by law. If you have contamination, <laughs> you got to do it. And, and we found that um, we're actually, as the economy goes down, business goes up for us, but people are always looking for ways to reduce costs. And in a down county, there's more pressure for that. Um, our distribution strategy, one of, the, one of the things that we want to switch to is that I want to actually, uh, rather than market directly to uh, cons uh, consulting engineering companies, I want to make this as an add-on feature as a lab data deliverable. Most labs right now just deliver an Excel spreadsheet. We want to essentially offer our service where we can generate and offer the data package right through the laboratories. Um, with our QR code and chain of custody uh, documentation, we actually save the labs. Um, I did a survey and r roughly we're saving labs anywhere from 3 to 10 percent on their labor costs. And so the way that we're going to monetize this is essentially capture that savings from the laboratories and that's what our fee would be. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, a $3.6 billion industry and you know, 3 percent is anywhere from $108 million to $216 million a year. So, um, and the reason I'm here is I'm looking for help. I'm looking for investors, partners, programmers, or any kind of assistance. And if you can't provide any of those, I'm looking for your prayers. Thank you. How big are you? Um, counting me, um, me. <laughs> I do have temporary uh, field staff that go out and, and do sampling and stuff like that, but if you're looking at the software part, it's me. So. You said you bootstrapped your revenue, though, so this is your full-time Yeah, it's my full-time job, yeah. Yeah, I noticed that in the workflow, you've digitized uh, reporting and so forth from the wells and that kind of data collection, but my question is, right? Yeah. yeah uh, well, my question is, why haven't those wells, why hasn't the product strategy been to add uh, like a reporting from the well itself, so that you cut out that process with act the well as sensor. Well, the, that technology exists, but it's very expensive. Um, and the you know the because it is regulated by the government, the government says here's here's the method that we accept for testing for benzene. You have to follow this method. So a lot of that remote type stuff is expensive, and it's not really government approved. So you still got to go out and collect the sample. Go ahead. Are you looking for scientists or to work with the wells and the installation and reading the data, or are you looking for technicians to work with the software? I'm looking for to develop this app and also to develop it as a product offered through the, the back end of a laboratory's uh, services. So mo mostly like software, program, and marketing help. The data that's collected, is it stored centrally by you or by the, la is the are the labs who run the analysis and the tests responsible for the data they collect? The data is stored on servers that we have, or that we rent basically. The labs basically deliver an Excel table. That's it. Go ahead. Could you talk a little bit about your competition? Right now our competition is uh, AutoCAD guys and GIS guys. Um, there's, there, there's one company that does a chain of custody, an electronic chain of custody, um, but he doesn't do the labels. He doesn't do the end reporting. So there are companies that do pieces of what we're doing, but there's nobody that I'm aware of that does from you know, inception to delivery of the final infographics. Any other questions? Go ahead. How many of these new installations are happening each year? That's the thing that most of you would be surprised about. Um, groundwater contamination is everywhere and new stuff is being discovered every day and new spills are happening every day. So um, in the state of Michigan, there are about 300 engineering consulting companies right now that do environmental work. Uh, there's about 14, maybe 17 labs. So that's one of the reasons I want to shift to going to the labs is they all have salespeople. Um, and they're, they're getting that business from those 300 people already. You and Herbal were actually threatened by a dachshund bloom that right. was going to sit around. Yeah, you know, Roger's actually very familiar with it, and I've actually done some work on that project. So I'm very familiar with it. Go ahead. The product done too many, and if so, have you done like many orders? Do you have clients? Yeah, we've been actually, the software that, you, that I showed you, and I, I didn't go live on it, but you can go to our website. There's a guest username and password right there. You can log in and, and generate some of these graphics that I just showed you. 
It's a web-based application right now. It's working. I need to develop it so that they, they can take a tablet into the field and use it there and enter their data in. If they don't have Wi-Fi or a con internet connection, it'll store it and upload it later. Go ahead. Do you, how many customers do you have right now using that web-based app? We've got probably uh, 35 customers right now. And they're engineering consulting companies. Some of them are oil companies. Um, and so, but they've got, there's, we've probably got about 120, 130 sites that we do. And we actually physically go out and sample, um, which is not what I'm talking about here. That's not why I'm here. But we physically sample all the way from Wyoming down to Florida. Um, I was just in Virginia last month. Uh, so I travel all over the country and sample. Our software is really good for these big projects, like the one in Ann Arbor um, that, we, that we were just talking about. Any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, so how did you discover this kind of uh, niche market? Like, how did you find that this need was there? Well, I'm a geologist, and I've been doing environmental work since I got out of college in 87. Um, and I'm innately lazy, so I look for efficient ways <laughs> to, uh, you know, minimize the amount of work that I have to do. And obviously software is uh, you know, just the way to go. And um, so I, I've been developing this software actually since 2002. What's interesting is one of the, you know, I try to sell this back in like 2002 and I would tell, ask people like, hey, uh, don't worry, it's a username and password protected. And I remember like one guy going, what's a user? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Are there other community announcements? Otherwise I have a crowdsourcing task I need your help on. Oh yeah, community announcement. Um, hi, I'm Patrick. I organize the uh, Ruby Group here in Ann Arbor. Um, we're going to be meeting two weeks from tonight on the 31st at Atomic Object. Although if the meeting gets bigger, we might have to find a new venue. Um, we're just, uh, this month we're going to be doing uh, beginner talks. And also, um, I am in the market for some sponsors, so if anybody would be interested in uh, sponsoring us, come talk to me. Yeah, hi, my name's Ben. I'm working on a project uh, called Alertly, which is essentially alerting as a service. So we scan data flows as data comes in. Uh, if conditions, are, if interesting conditions come up, we'll send the user a text message or an email. So sample applications would be like if you have a piece of equipment and you want to know, uh, send me a text message when it's thrown over 30 error conditions in the past month. Or show me, uh, send me a text message when uh, particular customers' orders are below a certain limit. We're at a point right now where we need some folks who could potentially apply our technology to, uh, to work with us and uh, let us play with their data sets and, and apply and work to their data sets. So if you have uh, that situation or uh, know someone who does, I'd really love to talk to you. Once again, my name is Ben. Thank you. I'm Steve. Uh, I work here in town at a company called Alpha Django. We build startups. We built some pretty cool startups, I think. We had uh, like hard code we presented last month that got acquired in October by Edmonds. And we're currently working on software that does a human genome sequence interpretation for diagnosing and treating cancers. Among other projects, we're looking for a project manager. So if you have a bit of technical background and like managing projects, come talk to me. And we're also looking for another developer. We work a lot with JavaScript and Ruby. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Dave Gregorka. By the way, Steve's company is very cool, so you should you should really check that one out if you're interested. Uh, um, I uh, I co-founded a company uh, in Ann Arbor called Health Media with Vic Strecker, uh, healthcare IT company. We sold that a number of years ago. I'm working with Vic to start another company up in the healthcare IT uh, area and health and wellness. Uh, and we are looking this summer for a couple of uh, interns uh, to help us out. One in, uh, in the QA area, testing quality assurance, uh, and another uh, in the uh, usability, user interaction design. So if you know of anybody that might want an internship with us, we're just getting this company off the ground. We've probably got about six, eight people on board right now. Uh, see me afterwards or uh, you can email our CTO. Her name is Lisa Shoot, L-I-S-A dot S-C-H-U-T-T-E at Comcast.net. Thanks. Yeah, yeah.
Sure. Um, my name is Matt Chatlin. I'm the founder of Own the Play, Inkwell. My uh, investor is right next to me. Our office is in downtown Birmingham. Our first product is going to directly compete with FanDuel and DraftKings. Um, our long-term goal is to be the largest casino manufacturer in the country. We're hiring a variety of positions. Um, I myself am a gambler, so come talk to me after. I'm interested to hear anyone. Awesome. Okay. Uh, I think then uh, I will hand it over to uh, Austin to uh, round out our presentation today. Thanks, Zach. Like Zach said, my name is Austin Waldo. I'm the co-founder of Optus Software. It's my dad over there, and business partner, other co-founder. And what we are is a multi-point inspection software for automotive dealerships. I'll explain what that is in a minute. Who's ever been to getting their car serviced, whether it's at a dealership or a pair shop and like left feeling like uh, maybe it got ripped off? Raise your hand. Okay, so you're not alone. Actually, Gallup data um, that was taken this past December, it like asked basically what different, um, rate the honesty and ethical standards of people in different fields. At the top are nurses, you know, medical doctor, pharmacists. At the bottom is members of Congress, and right above them are car salesmen. <laughs> so this, like, play, uh, the, the distrust kind of plagues the dealership industry and the car industry. So um, we are basically solving this, this trust, trust issues that trust issue that the dealerships have. We're, uh, so what happens when you go and get your car serviced at a dealership or a repair shop? Always at dealerships, usually for the, the OEM mandates this, but there's an inspection sheet that they go through. It's color coordinated, it's paper form that the mechanic or technician uses when they're going through. It's kind of sections out your vehicle and then they can mark it if, there, if there's any issues. And um, we're basically taking this inspection sheet and digitizing it. So now the technicians are able to access this through a mobile device or a tablet. And the real beauty behind that is obviously there's analytics and um, you know, paperless, but the, the real reason why we're doing this, and this solves the trust issue, is now the mechanics are able to visually document via videos and pictures of these additional service requests that they're gonna send to the customer. So the customer can actually see what they're being um, upsold. And these upsells are called additional service requests. Um, again, uh, see, seeing is believing, and the, um, you know, this, this, will, this helps out with the trust uh, between the dealership and the customer. So we have talked with over 40 different dealerships and auto repair shops that are really interested in utilizing our, our software that have said that they, are, they want to demo uh, us once we're kind of ready to go. We, we've done a controlled alpha test our, so our software uh, about three weeks ago. And you now kind of everything worked out technically speaking, but things we're kind of going back to, you know, it's always a process, but we're going back to basically making things more streamlined and we're, we're really working with our user interface. Technicians or mechanics are not necessarily the most technologically savvy people. So things need to be very minimalist and very you know, clean and, and streamlined. So um, it's a huge opportunity. The price point for this kind of software is actually around $1,000 a month. It's a traditional software as a service where we have a set up fee and a monthly um, fee from here. There are some competitors in the space there's people that are you know, on this side of the spectrum which are literally sending customers a bit.ly link with a link to the video and that's all it is. And they're charging between $700 and $1,200 a month and then there's people on the other side where they're focusing on, okay, it's paperless so they're gonna do productivity and they don't really focus on the, the trust building aspect which is what we're focused on kind of more in the middle. So with that being said, we're looking for design and mobile hackers, people that have, again, um, uh, we have a full-time developer, uh, full-time developer, and we're looking for you know a, a part-time developer, maybe a couple. So um, again, trying to get this thing more simplest, simple, simple, and uh, minimalist. So we have a demo video. You can go to optusoftware.com, check it out. It's about four minutes long. Um, and then if you are interested uh, in con connecting with us, just email at uh, hello at optusoftware.com. Thanks. Questions. So you talk about dealerships. There are individual mechanics. How are you going to market it to them? So to have the mechanics use it? No, independent mechanics like that are not working. Okay, at so our, we're focusing on dealerships right now just because they have deeper pockets. There are other people that um, you know. Are, there's there's like I don't know probably about 
five players in, the, in, the, in this kind of market, and some of them only focus on these like repair shops, independent repair shops. But we're again kind of just focusing on, on dealerships. We we have another thing built in. It's a customer tracker. So if you've ever ordered from Domino's Pizza, they have like the you know customer tracker. We kind of you know just rip that off and put it, uh, utilize it. I guess great artists borrow or good artists borrow, great artists steal. That's probably Picasso said. Um, and so that's something that more like a dealership would be interested in using. And, and some of the analytics too. It just makes more sense with a dealership. Are you going after large dealer networks like La Fontaine and Suburban, or are you going yeah. for individual dealers? Um, both. I mean, obviously, you can get a home run with a, a, a dealer network that's a big win. And one of the we're actually talking with a uh, 35 dealer network. They're they're called Victory, and they're yeah they're yeah they're they're interested in what we're doing. So I actually spent quite a bit of this past summer at one of their dealerships in in Canton. Are you competing with like the dealer management systems? No. no. So yeah, there, there's this thing called dealer management systems, and if anyone's ever dealt with them, they're like everyone hates them. They're super archaic, super old school. It looks like you're like kind of looking at you know software from 1998. Uh, and, and these guys, they're but they're running the shop to the dealer. Yeah, we're not we're not competing with them. Um, this version that we have actually. Uh, it could have been kind of integrated, and that's kind of what we were thinking about going, integrating with the DMSs, the DM management systems, but our new, more streamlined version is not going to be worried about that at all. Because if you think about the paper form, the multi-point inspection sheet, it, that actually doesn't integrate. The RO, which is a printout from the dealer management system, it's kind of like the, the work order of everything, they just staple that to the, the multi-point inspection sheet and hand it to the customer. So we're basically just saying, you don't have to have this you know, physical paper anymore. You want, if you want, you can actually print it out at the end and then staple it. And, and they, they, some people like to do that. But you can also SMS, text it, that inspection sheet to the customer, or email it to them. But yeah, we're not trying to replace those, those guys. Yes. yes. What are you doing about like these things are in dealership things? They need to be uh, like you have know, turtle shells, or I mean the the whole oil grease yeah. survivability. We, we, we've experimented with different things to try and make them bulletproof. So uh, um, right now we're using mini iPads and put some cases on those. So they seem to hold up pretty well. Yeah, he's actually been kind of working on this. Um, it's kind of like a, in a sense, like a, a side project, but it's it's called the Halo, and it's actually kind of like a, uh, a heavy duty case for for tablets, but. At the end of the day, a lot of, I mean, I spent a ton of time with dealerships and a lot of the mechanics, even when they're in downtime, they'll just pull out YouTube or go on Facebook with their smartphones anyway. So it's not like, you know, they have, they have gloves and they have like, um, you know, stuff that'll get the oil off their hands. So. What stage are you at? And have you had this in the hands of any dealers yet? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say that we're kind of like in between alpha and beta. Um, we, like I said, like three weeks ago, we, we were in a uh, dealership, and again, you know, things worked out technically speaking, just like the workflow took too long. And even for the, the core of the software is, is the, with the, um, you know, the technician and when they're doing the inspection process. But we had actually, there's like five, and again, I'd, if you're curious to see it, I'd encourage you to watch the demo video on our website Optus, at optussoftware.com. But pretty much, you know, there was like about five different portals for different users. There's a, there's a check-in portal, there's a, a portal for the service advisor, who's like a server at a restaurant who talks, he's a li liaison between the garage and then the, the customer, um, but we're kind of cutting a lot of that out, and really we're just focusing on, you know, they're starting with the technician, instead of starting with the check-in, you go to the service advisor, who then go to the dispatch, and then go to the technician. You know, it's, there's so much you can kind of like have in your head, but once you, you know, you see it in action, then you're like, okay, well, this doesn't work. And so we're kind of in that stage of making things work. And we're like kind of zoning in on, you know, making things more streamlined. Did you want to take one more question? Yeah. Is this integrated with the DMS in any way? And is it a no. loyalty built in? in no. We, so it has redundant data entry? That's, that's one of the things. Um, with with the, no, the current version, our alpha version, there was 
uh, points where if we were integrating, then it might have not been an issue with the workflow. But we realized that, yeah, we could do that. But like, if you've ever worked with Reynolds, Reynolds or ADP, uh, they're just like a pain in the butt to integrate with. But they're and all over. They're all over, but we can get what we want done in terms of building the trust, that's our core thing that we're doing, without even integrating. Because again, that paper form, MP, or the, the inspection sheet, doesn't integrate with the, the, the DMS. They'll just staple it to the printout from the DMS at the end hand to the customer. So we can just literally eliminate them, staple it to the, D, the DMS printout, and just email it to the customer or protect it to the customer. And they can still print it out, actually, and then still staple it to the customer just like normal. And loyalty is it built in? Or? What do you mean by loyalty? Well, I'm here today and I need my oil done in 90 days. Is there any continuity program or any follow up that's built into A lot of the DMSs have follow up programs uh, where they. To your point, they're not that high. Yeah. Okay. So, right, yeah. I mean, I'm going to gently suggest you guys take the discussion offline. It sounds like a good <laughs> thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So that concludes our formal programming. Uh, does anyone know if Dominix is open and what the temperature is currently outside? <laughs> okay, this is your seating. Good, yeah. So traditionally, uh, a bit after the event, after people have a chance to sort of Google and get some questions answered, we end up uh, going somewhere. Living reservations. Okay, yeah. So maybe maybe pizza. Yeah. All right, thanks everyone.